literally in 48 hours, I am going to be going to France with two of my best friends to attend a ball in Versailles. Hello, hello, my name's Shay, and this project I've been planning for the past three years. Me and two of my best friends are gonna be flying to France to attend a ball, like a real 18th century ball in a palace with fancy dresses and dancing and everything. It's called Fetes Galentes, and it's held once a year at the Palace of Versailles, AKA the actual palace King Louis XIV and Marie Antoinette lived in, like the real deal. The Palace of Versailles is kind of like a museum, but for this one night a year, they host a ball just like the old days. And everyone, including the folks working the event, are dressed in full 18th century fashion. So of course we know what that means. I need to make a dress for it. And of course, I have also procrastinated. Because what is a Shea project if not a procrastination project? I originally set a whole two months aside to make this dress. I ended up making a bunch of other stuff instead. And now we're making the dress in like a week. That all said, it's go time. Let's make ourselves a ball gown. So before I can even touch designs, I gotta do a whole lot of research. So the ball is set during the times of Marie Antoinette, basically late 1700s. So I'm gonna find a bunch of dresses from the 18th and 1900s that I can kind of base my look off of. I just wanna say I love the historical girlies on YouTube. I am not a historical girly. <laughs> I've actually never made any sort of historical ball gown before, and it kind of terrifies me. With costume work, original designs, there aren't any strict rules, there's no wrong way to do anything. But with historical dresses, there is a wrong way to do stuff, and they do not have hot glue in the 1800s, so... <laughs> Welcome to 18th century dresses for beginners. Ta-da! Disclaimer, this isn't like super detailed research. This is just the general trends that I saw when looking at a bunch of dresses. Starting at the top of the dress, they usually had these swooping necklines. They also almost always had sleeves and the sleeves sometimes had a ruffle or embellishment or lace at the end just to make it fancy. They also seem to have front closures, whether it be through a row of buttons or a stomacher. And speaking of it closing in the front, these dresses were almost built like coats. So the top bodice piece was connected usually to the outermost layer of the skirt. And speaking of layers, they like their layers. Chemise, stays, paniers, petticoat, underskirt, overskirt, stomacher. It's a lot of layers, okay? And most importantly, the shape of these dresses. It was usually like flat conical chest and wide hips. They would use something like stays to create that very structured conical shape on the top. And then paniers, which are like these hip hoop skirts to create the very wide hip silhouette. Other notable things of this period, they liked the tall hair. They got really crazy with that for a while. And because this is like a fancy royal court dress, they oftentimes would have a lot of decorations and embellishments. You can go a ton way more in depth with it. There's different styles. There's the French style, the English style, the Polish style dress. This is not a thorough breakdown, but hopefully you have a better sense of 18th century dresses and what we're getting into. Maybe I'm just overconfident. Doesn't look that hard to make. Famous last words. This might come to bite me in the butt. Okay, we've got the basic idea, let's start sketching. Since this is my first one, I'm keeping it a bit simpler and I'm just gonna go with the very classic robe a la Frenche, the French robe. Also known as the sack dress or the sack back dress because it has these big drapey pleats on the back. I'll be honest, baby's first historical gown, we're not gonna go too fancy. That's a pretty solid sketch. So we have our design, I really like the shape, and I'm just gonna head up to the LA Fashion District and pick my fabrics. I'm honestly not sure what color I want this dress to be. That's kind of the fun thing with original designs like this. I don't have to color match to reference images. So I'm going to the Fashion District with a bit of a looser plan and just seeing what fabric and what trims I like. And we've got our fabrics. I got this beautiful purple like color shifting silk for the main part of the dress. And then I have some white fabric at home that I'm gonna use for the under petticoat. And then I splurged a little bit and I bought one yard of beaded lace. Isn't that stunning? It's way more than I usually spend on fabric, but it's like, it's a ball. We're going to a ball at Versailles. I gotta be fancy. Now that we've got our supplies and our plan, we can start making it. The thing about 18th century clothes is they have a lot of layers. You start with the chemise that goes under everything just to keep it all clean. Then on top of that, you have your stays or like your corset. Then we have the hoop skirt or the paniers to support the big old skirt. Then on top of that, you have a petticoat to kind of smooth over and hide the hoops. And then on top of that, you'll have another petticoat as like an outer petticoat, which is actually going to be seen. And then last you have your outer gown, which is your top and the outer part of your skirt. So now that we know all the layers we need, we can start knocking them out, starting with the undergarments. I'm a big believer with costumes and stuff to work smarter, not harder. If you're truly passionate about making a hoop skirt from scratch, 
go for it. But you can also find costume hoop skirts like this for like 20 bucks. There's no shame whether it's cosplay or historical fashion in just buying something if you don't like making it. Again, this is for fun. You don't have to suffer. So same thing with the other undergarments. I'm just buying a chemise. It's okay, it's gonna be under my dress. I even bought my stays online. They gave me a decent silhouette. They weren't perfect, but I'm gonna modify it a bit and add a bit more boning to it. And this looks like a pair of stays that I would make. You don't have to do everything from scratch. It's okay to take shortcuts. This is for fun. It wasn't starting to feel real until I got the stays done. Look, look how pretty they are. I am getting really hyped for this. And with our three layers of undergarments figured out, I can finally start tackling the main part of the dress, the overcoat. So the first thing we've got to do is get our pattern sorted. After honestly spending all day looking through patterns, the pattern that makes the most sense to my brain is this one by Janet Arnold. So I have the pattern on my iPad and I'm just going to copy the measurements. How these sort of patterns work is they basically show it to you really little on a grid and then you just have to draw it yourself on grid paper. So this is literally just connect the dots for me. Good thing is I like math and this is all math. <laughs> and then this is the pattern for the sleeve. Ta-da! And that's all of our pattern pieces. So that took a lot longer than I expected, like a solid four hours. Now they've got the pattern, I've got to fit it to myself because this is just for some random 18th century gown, not one that fits me. So I'm going to make a mock up out of muslin. I'm just gonna cut all my pattern pieces out of muslin, pin them, sew them together, and see how it fits. Okay, this is our mock up, and it actually fits me just about perfect, so I don't have to make any adjustments. And it looks very like French and wee wee and 18th century. I don't know how, but this is all working out. I even draped out the, like the outer train part of the dress, and it looks really good too. Excuse me, that is a French fall gown. So now that I know I like my pattern, I just gonna make it in my real fabric. I just downed this whole frappuccino and we are ready to get started again. Side note, a quick outfit call out. I really love this jumpsuit and it's from the sponsor of today's video, ThreadUp. ThreadUp is basically an online thrift store. And if you're wondering what type of clothes you can find on ThreadUp, literally just take a look at what I'm wearing in most of my videos. So many of my favorite clothes just in my closet are from ThreadUp. I really like it because the fact that it's online means that I can do it from my house, it's really convenient and it's searchable. So I can actually search for the specific items that I want. And because all the clothes are secondhand, it's still affordable and better for the environment. After the historical ball in Versailles, my friends and I were just gonna be running around Paris for a week. So I actually thrifted most of my outfits for Paris from ThreadUp. So here's a little mini haul and what I wore in Paris. First up, I found these Topshop casual pants. They retail for about $81, I paid 16. And I paired it with this funky top for this fancy little look that was both a little fancy and Parisian, but also still funky and colorful in my style. I also found this yellow Topshop short sleeve t-shirt. It retails for about $32, I got it for about 10.50 on ThreadUp. And I thought it was super cute and summery, so I paired it with this Topshop denim skirt that I also got on ThreadUp. It was 10.40 on ThreadUp, it retails for like $68. But this little skirt combo was just the first of many any skirts I got for this trip because when I travel and I'm not sure what the weather is, I go with skirts. If it's warm, you pop some safety shorts under them and you're good, it's a summery look. If it's cold, you wear them with a sweater, you wear them with leggings, you're cozy, you're cute, it's perfect. Skirts are just so versatile and so cute and so easy to style. So they basically were half my Paris wardrobe. Lastly, we wanted one fancy-ish look. So I got this dark pink casual dress. It retails for about $36. On ThreadUp, it was 25. And I wore it when we had a little dinner picnic in front of the Eiffel Tower, which is honestly one of the highlights of this trip. But if you like these clothes that I bought on my trip, you can click on my link to see all of the clothes that I bought. And if you wanna buy something similar for yourself on ThreadUp, you can actually just click shop similar and it will show you a bunch of similar items that you can get your on ThreadUp. It's a pretty cool feature, but on top of that, ThreadUp gave me a promo code, so you can use code CRESCENT for 40% off your first order. This is actually the highest discount code that they've ever given me, so definitely worth checking out. It's obviously a service that I use and I love and I'm happy to recommend, so enjoy 40% off. And again, thank you so much to ThreadUp for sponsoring this video and for just making projects like this possible. But with all that said, let's get back to sewing because goodness knows I'm running out of time. Now that I finally have a pattern that I like, I can finally use my real pretty fabric. I'm just gonna use the exact same patterns and cut it all out of my real fabric. It's like starting to hit that literally in 48 hours I am going to be going to France with two of my best friends to attend a ball in Versailles. Like, okay, Shayla get back on it. 
that is the pattern for the skirt. It looks crazy, but it's all gonna get pleated down. And that up there is the pattern for the top. So now I'm going to pin all the pieces together and then follow the line from the pattern to pleat this big old sack back down. That is our sack back all pleated. It looks like a mess, but the overskirt is all pinned. So I'm gonna put it on my dress form really quick to try it on. Once I know it sits right, I'm just gonna sew it up. That's the 18th century ball gown. The overcoat just like pulls the whole thing together. Oh my God. So back in the 1700s, they did not have sewing machines. I am going to be using my sewing machine. Hand sewing this entire gown does not seem fun. Usually you could do like little invisible hand sews. I'm gonna be top stitching it. It probably wasn't my brightest idea to sew an entire 18th century ball gown three days before my flight. <laughs> but we're making it work. For the stomacher piece, I'm doing something a little bit different. I'm also gonna sew boning channels and put boning in there just to give it enough structure to really stay flat. It's gonna hold its shape so much better. Now that it's sewn, I get to do the lovely work of ironing and pleating everything. So let's get pleating. Silk is beautiful, but it's just such a pain because you have to press out everything. Okay, we finally have our whole hoop skirt done. Now that we've got all of our fancy fabric sewn, I can take my mock-up again and use it as the lining. So I'm going to sew these two together. I think I did it! It's definitely not perfect, but I'm going to stop fiddling with it and I'm just going to call it good because I think it looks nice! We pretty much finished the overcoat. That is a big relief. That means no matter what, I will have a dress to wear. But under that, you need a petticoat. I kind of left patterns behind at like 3 a.m. We're kind of just vibing with shapes now. I'll go pleat up this petticoat and then I will do the white one on top of that. Okay, this is probably the weirdest petticoat you've ever seen, but it's still gonna work. We are on the last thing I need to drape, which is the under petticoat. I'm basically just putting my fabric on my dress form and just draping night pleats all around until it fits my waistband. It's just a skirt that fits my dress form. And with that, all layers of our skirt are done. Okay, the hard part's over now. We're just gonna make it pretty now. It's four hours till we leave for our flight, so I recruited help to make some of the decorations for the dress. We're just adding lace and ruffle squiggles all over this dress, just vaguely trying to mimic the designs I saw on other historical dresses. We are an hour from having to leave for the airport, so I'm gonna finish up a couple of blasts of these embellishments on this guy, but then he's just gonna get packed up and we're gonna hand sew him at the hotel. I don't know how, but in the past, like, 30 minutes an hour, she just came to life. And I still obviously got a little bit to do with like the hand sewing of this and like little touches and there's like obviously a gazillion pins in her, but that's a ball gown. I don't know what to say, we did it. Biggest shout out to Kronos for helping me sew for the last like two hours and for coming to France with me. Very exciting. It's gonna be so much fun. But I'm gonna go put her in the bag and we are off to France. So it's currently Monday morning, the day of the ball. The dress is pretty much done. It's like wearable at this point. There's a couple more embellishments I need to sew on, mostly just the squiggles. So I'm gonna take a little bit of this morning to hand sew and then we'll pack up and head to Versailles. So thanks to my friend's help, dress is done. Now we are headed to Versailles to get ready. We made it to Versailles. We're here in Versailles in our hotel and now we're gonna get ready for the ball. First things first, we're gonna get glammed up then I can put on all of the layers. Chemise, stays, pockets, hoop skirt, first petticoat, over petticoat, outer dress. Okay, so that I think is everything. We are in full court dress. Now I'm gonna put on my wig. This is by Wig in the City. They did an incredible job. Oh my God, this thing is huge. <laughs> you look so The wig makes it, right? I cannot put into words how incredible this ball was. Just walking up to Versailles, it felt magical because you're walking up to the gates of this beautiful palace surrounded by all these people also in beautiful gowns and you walk inside and it really feels like you're attending one of Marie Antoinette's parties. They had dances and dance lessons and musicians and tours of the rooms and honestly the best part, all these fancy little foods that you could eat. 
at the end of the night in the Hall of Mirrors, this gorgeous, gorgeous room, there was a big final dance and you met and talked to people and danced with each other. This is something I've wanted to do for years now and it happened and it was just everything I could have dreamed of. <laughs> And we are headed off to the airport. That is the end of our Paris Versailles trip. It was incredible, 10 out of 10, we'll be doing again. And if this is something you wanna to do too, please, please do it. There's no special requirements to get a ticket. I just bought mine online at the Palace of Versailles website and you do not have to sew your own dress. A lot of people rent their dresses and my two friends that were with me, they got their dresses off Amazon and they looked stunning. Sometimes the historical costuming spaces can be intimidating when you feel like everything has to be perfect, but everyone there was so kind and we were all just dancing and having a good time. I also want to give a big, big thank you to Asa Darling. She's an incredible historical costumer and YouTuber and she was so, so much help in making this dress. Definitely check out her stuff if you're interested in more of the historical side of stuff. Asta, Burnett Banner, So Steam, they're all really great resources if you want to learn how to actually sew historical garments. I'm still a beginner and I'm just kind of trying stuff out. And lastly, thank you again so much to ThreadUp for sponsoring this video. Really, this is the only way that a big international trip like this would ever be possible. So if you like the outfits I was wearing in Paris and want to get some of your own, definitely check out ThreadUp. Use my link in the description to see what I wore and use code CRESCENT for an extra 40% off your entire first order. But that's it for this project. Subscribe if you want to see my next projects. Check me out on Instagram for the daily updates. And thank you so much for watching. Have a great day. Bye-bye.